Could you start by telling me a little bit about what you and your colleagues wanted to look at in terms of pretend play? Pretend play is an activity that kids participate in around the world. All typically developing children, no matter where they're from, like to engage in pretend play. Um, and they engage in play that has to do with the worlds that they live in. And so kids will pretend to go into the kitchen and bake something. Kids will pretend to go on adventures and find treasures. Um, if kids are in a culture where there's a lot of fishing, kids will pretend to go fishing. So it does relate back to the environments that they're being raised in. And one of the big questions, one of the central questions that developmental psychologists have about pretend play is why? Why is this a universal activity? Is it because it's helping kids learn about the real world? Is it helping prepare them with the sorts of cognitive or social or emotional skills that might help them later in development? Um, um, or does it have some other purpose? So that really is the question that guides my lab's work. Tell me about your most recent research when you were looking at dramatic play. Mm -hmm. First of all, if you could describe for our viewers what the difference is between Absolutely. just pretend play and dramatic play. The difference for me between pretend play and dramatic play is whether or not the child is taking on a character. So are they engaging in playing a role, um, perhaps a person that has a different personality than their own or a different set of goals than their own sets of goals. So they sort of are taking a bit of a third person perspective on themselves, stepping away from themselves, and a first person perspective on somebody else. So for me, that's really the difference between regular pretend play and dramatic pretend play is, is the use of a character um, or a role that the child is stepping into. And for me, I've had a hypothesis for a long time that this type of dramatic pretend play specifically helps children with social and emotional development. There's something about stepping into different characters that have different viewpoints, different emotional lives, different perspectives on the world that I think gives kids a safe space to practice having different perspectives, different emotions, different viewpoints on the world. And I think that this kind of practice that they get in dramatic pretend play can then transfer into the ways in which they can interact in the real world. Tell me a little bit about how you went about studying this, how many children were involved, mm -hmm. um, over what period of time. Mm -hmm and how and your colleagues studied um, th their play. We started from the perspective that the, the height of pretend play is really this sort of three to six year old age range. And pretend play gets more and more complicated over time. And actually children take on more and more first person roles over time as they uh, go through preschool and into the early schooling years. So we were really interested in uh, this age group and we focused in on a group of five-year-old children the summer before they were about to enter kindergarten. And we worked with 97 children in a Head Start preschool. And we had them uh, go into one of three different kinds of groups. So one of the big questions, of course, whenever you study pretend play or any other kind of childhood activity is whether there's something unique about the activity itself that might be helping kids or whether any kind of activity might be helping kids. So it's really important to have control groups. Control groups being um, something, a group that has a lot of the same elements as the activity you're interested in, but isn't exactly the same. So a third of our kids uh, had dramatic pretend play experience over the course of our eight week experiment. A third of the kids did a story time activity where it was a, you know, a circle of kids with a research assistant listening to stories. And a third of our kids uh, played with blocks, building structures and, and other sorts of um, uh, you know, animals out of blocks and, and those sorts of things. And what was unique about the dramatic pretend play group was that they got to physically embody first person characters. So they got to um, pretend that they were a monkey and move around, or they got to pretend that they were a chef and prepare a meal, or they got to pretend they were a king and order other people around. And we looked at whether over the course of those eight weeks it affected their emotional understanding and their emotional control. 
And what we found was that the children who were in the dramatic pretend play group increased their emotional control over the course of the eight weeks above and beyond the children in either the story time group or the children in the block play group. How are you able to measure um, whether or not they were able to improve their emotional control? We used three different measures of emotional control. The first one was a uh, what we call a puppet interview. And so my research assistants and I had two little puppets. Um, one of these puppets was always emotionally out of control, got very upset a lot, couldn't handle or understand their own emotions, right? So this is my non-controlled puppet. And then my other puppet uh, was always very emotionally controlled and was um, able to engage in appropriate emotional responding. So, for example, uh, if somebody I care about is really upset, it's good emotional control to be sort of empathically upset with them, but it's bad emotional control to be so overly upset by their anger or their fear that I can't interact with them at all. Um, and so we asked the children for a variety of different scenarios which puppet they were more like. Were they more like the one who was out of control or more like the one who was in control? And the children in the dramatic playgroup got better at that over time. The other way that we measured emotional control um, was uh, I had some very clumsy research assistants who kept snapping their fingers in clipboards and banging their knees on tables and spilling over boxes of paper and sort of generally having bad things happen to them. And then we looked at the children's reactions. Did they freeze? Did they begin to cry? Did they start to lose control of their body or lose control over their emotions? Um, we also looked at whether they helped or whether they comforted. And what we found was that the children in the pretend play group, the dramatic pretend play group, got better at this emotional control. They, they became less overwhelmed by these different scenarios. They had um, less less loss of control of their body or of their emotions over time. Um, they did not actually get any more helpful above and beyond the two control groups. So all of the kids got more helpful over time, um, but the dramatic pretend play group got uniquely more controlled. What do those findings suggest? The findings suggest that Engaging in dramatic pretend play is one avenue that children can use in order to practice emotions, practice the beginnings and ends of emotion, practice the understanding that emotion is a thing that can be controlled in a relatively safe, contained way. Many of the activities that the children engaged in in the dramatic pretend play group involved stopping and starting emotions, involved, um, for example, uh, pretending to be sad in a very, very small way, and then pretending to be sad in a very, very large way. And so what I think is happening is that through this practice, as with any type of learning practice, kids are learning what their emotions feel like in their bodies, what their emotions feel like in themselves, and how they can begin to modulate and control those emotions as they experience them. And so this dramatic pretend play is, is sort of one avenue that children can use to then, when they are faced with a real life emotional scenario, sort of either consciously or unconsciously think to themselves, right, I don't have to show big sadness right now. I can show small sadness right now. Or I'm feeling a lot of anger welling up inside. What are some ways I can handle that anger? I can think about that anger um, in order to more appropriately match my emotional response to the situation I'm in and make sure that I'm controlled in a way that's appropriate. Why is that an important skill, especially at this age range? Emotional control really is the basis of social interaction. So we want our kids to have social bonds with their peers, with their teachers, with their siblings, with their parents. We want them to be able to get along in a classroom. We want them to be able to get along in, in their families. And a child that has good emotional control that means that they can be helpful. That means that they can be empathic. That means that they uh, know how to appropriately respond to somebody else's emotions. A child who doesn't have good emotional control will easily become 
become overwhelmed by situations or overwhelmed by the sort of um, social negotiations that we have to go through every day in order to be productive and, and sort of uh, socially, socially healthy members of, of our families, of our relationships, and our societies. There is a, um, there is a theory of, of, of what's called um, the cascade of social awareness or the cascade of social skills, which basically means if a child has good emotional control, it means that they're able to then stop thinking about themselves and start thinking about other people. And if they can think about other people and pay attention to other people, then they can react appropriately. And then they can be altruistic, then they can be helpful. And that's, that's really how you get good citizens, that's how you get um, kids with lots of friendships and good peer networks. And all of those things also, they're not just good for their own sake, right? We all want to be good sort of parts of our community, but they're also good because they predict learning, they predict academic competence, and they predict achievement both in school and then later on in the workplace. Are there any tips that you can give parents, any suggestions for things they can do at home even while their, their child is playing mm -hmm. that could help? Number one thing that I always say is really get down on the floor and play with your kids and follow their lead. You know, kids have great imaginations sort of unfettered by the, the requirements of culture or by preconceived notions of what they should or should not be doing in their play. And this doesn't require a big fancy play kitchen. It doesn't require hundreds of Legos or anything like that. Really, um, you are your child's favorite toy. And so getting down on the floor, playing with them and, and following the ideas that they have and the direction that they want to go and the story that they want to tell is really, it's a great way to, to get to know your child, to make your child have a sense of self-worth and importance. Um, and, you know, kids don't get to make a lot of choices about their own lives, but if you can give them 15 minutes in a pretend world where they're fully in charge, that can give them a, a sense of understanding understanding of their own wants and needs. Just any kind of role playing would, would be a place to start? Sure. I mean, any kind of role playing really is this kind of dramatic play, but it can really be any kind of play at all. And as children get older, they get more and more into playing these roles. You know, a younger child, a, a two-year-old or a three-year-old might just be interested in pushing cars around a carpet. Um, but as that child gets a little bit older, she'll want to put on a costume and have a tea party. And then as she gets even a little bit older, Older, she'll want to develop a whole fantasy scenario about flying to Jupiter and being the first astronaut to explore that planet. And so meeting your child where they are and playing the game that they want to play is just a really great thing for parents to do for their kids. Is there anything I didn't ask you about this research that you would want to make sure that people know? One thing I didn't talk about is that the motivation for this research really comes from theater and drama and from what it may be that acting and theater and drama does for kids. Uh, there's lots and lots of anecdotes and stories about how being involved in drama and theater changes children's lives, but there's not a lot of rigorous scientific research to back up those claims. So we sort of came at this study from two perspectives. One is that pretend play is something that every child does, and so we really want to get a good handle on what it's doing for kids. But the other is the reason we looked at dramatic pretend play specifically is to start to answer the question of, of why theater seems to be something that so many kids have a passion for um, and, and what that kind of artistic, emotional, expressive activity might be doing for kids. Is that an avenue of research for you? Yes. Is that something down the, down the road? Yes, so actually my dissertation was about theater 
and looking at um, theater classes for older kids, um, nine-year-olds and 14-year-olds, and, and how theater might actually be increasing empathy uh, and theory of mind, which is this understanding of somebody else's mental states um, that sort of continuously develops. And uh, right now my lab is, is doing a couple of different projects looking into how theater teachers might be teaching social and emotional skills to adolescents and how they might be talking to adolescents about their, their emotional lives and their social lives. If you could tell me where you got your undergraduate, your mm -hmm. master's, and your advanced degree. I did my undergraduate studies at Cornell University. I actually double majored in psychology and theater. And then I worked for a few years as a professional actress and dancer and waitress and nanny and temp and all those other fun things in New York City. Um, I did both my master's and PhD in developmental psychology at Boston College. Um, then I had a postdoctoral fellowship in developmental psychology at Yale University. Um, then I was a professor for a few years at a school in New York City, Pace University, before beginning my position here at George Mason.